Of course, everyone feels positive that the music that came out when they were in high school was definitely the best music ever, but surely they can't all be right. Unless they were young in 1977, when Steely Dan released Asia, then, well, who's to say? But for the most part, tastes shift as eras progress, and new generations start making music of their own. And it's impossible to settle on just one moment, one year, or one era as the greatest in rock and roll history. But having said that, 1991 still makes a pretty solid case. Even if not the best year ever for music, it was certainly a game changer for rock. Today we're looking back at some of the peak albums and moments from the year of our Lord, 1991. But first, be sure you're subscribed to the Weird History channel here on YouTube for a lot more great videos, and leave us a comment letting us know your favorite 90s band. You a cracker guy? Prefer getting brown with ween? Despondent ever since the spin doctors left our lives? Well, we want to hear from you. Undeniably ranking among 1991's biggest and most impactful releases was Nirvana's Nevermind album which not only announced the arrival of Seattle's brand of grunge rock to the international scene, but also launched a thousand, hey, whatever happened to that naked baby viral internet articles? There were a number of grunge rock bands prior to the release of Nevermind in September 91, of course, and some had even had a measure of popular success. Nirvana themselves had already released a prior album, Bleach. But the hit-heavy Nevermind, which included breakout songs like Come As You Are, Lithium, In Bloom, and the generation-defining Smells Like Teen Spirit introduced a depth, nuance, anti-establishment sentiment, and just plain weirdness that solidified the genre in the minds of fans around the world. It also made Nirvana likely the biggest band in the world, and frontman Kurt Cobain the most notable celebrity in all of rock. This ended up having some unfortunate consequences, of course, but let's focus on the positive. We're making a pro-1991 case here. Nevermind was added to the National Recording Registry in 2004, and it often pops up on lists of the greatest albums of all time. Pearl Jam's iconic grunge rock Statement 10 actually predates Nevermind by just a month, coming out in late August of 91. At this point, Pearl Jam was something of a Seattle supergroup, cobbled together from members of other early Seattle grunge acts. That is, except lead singer Eddie Vedder, who wasn't even a Seattle native. He was a surfer bro from San Diego whose unique blend of mumbling and wailing just proved a perfect complement for the grunge rock sound. Ten wasn't an immediate hit, but became a wildly popular grunge landmark that helped set the blueprint for future 90s alternative rock bands to follow. The album has since gone platinum 13 times over in the U.S. Author Elizabeth Wurzel, who wrote Prozac Nation, famously called Holes Pretty on the Inside the most compelling album that got released overall in 1991, though it was the follow-up, Live Through This, that brought the band their greatest acclaim. Courtney Love herself has even said that she finds the group's debut album unlistenable. Still, Wurzel may not have been entirely off the mark. Hole was able to marry grunge together with punk, metal, and riot girl aesthetics to create something abrasive and confrontational and altogether new. Meanwhile, Seattle grunge vet Soundgarden already had two mildly successful albums by October 1991 when they dropped Bad Motor Finger, which took the group to the next level of fame and popularity, landing them coverage on MTV, which still occasionally featured music back then, and scoring the band their first ever Grammy nomination. Even more so than 10 and Nevermind, Bad Motorfinger makes a lot of departures from the standard grunge rock sound, with the addition of a healthy dose of heavy metal on songs like Rusty Cage and Jesus Christ Pose, alongside more melancholic and gloomy Seattle sounds. Bad Motorfinger was actually scheduled for release on September 24th, the same day as Nevermind, but production problems pushed the street date back to October 8th. Members of Pearl Jam and Soundgarden actually teamed up in April of 1991 on a tribute to early grunge pioneer Andrew Wood, who had led Mother Love Bone as well as the influential Malfunction. Pearl Jam's Stone Gossard and Jeff Amen were actually former bandmates of Wood's from Mother Love Bone, giving their involvement some added poignancy. The album was never intended as a mainstream commercial release, but a tribute to a fallen friend. Nevertheless, popular singles Hunger Strike and Say Hello to Heaven catapulted into the mainstream and it went on to go platinum in the U.S. It's still considered a seminal release in grunge history. The self-titled Metallica, more commonly referred to by fans as the Black Album, was the band's first studio release since And Justice For All back in 1988 and introduced a less heavy, thrashy, and more polished update to their classic sound. 
This turned off a lot of longtime fans who were still all about Master of Puppets, but it expanded Metallica's audience significantly, launching them beyond a Bay Area metal favorite and into the ranks of the world's most successful rock acts. It also gave us some of the all-time greatest and most memorable Metallica songs, including Nothing Else Matters and the classic Enter Sandman. Another band that gave themselves and their music a makeover in 1991 was Dublin's iconic U2. The group had started out with a post-punk sound, which became more ethereal and experimental on albums like The Unforgettable Fire and The Joshua Tree in the later patch of the 1980s. But with 1991's Achtung Baby, they completely reinvented themselves for a new era, adding notes of grunge, alt-rock, and even industrial music in singles like One, Mysterious Ways, and The Fly. After 1987's smash hit Appetite for Destruction, Guns N' Roses entered the 90s as the biggest rock band in America and perhaps the world. 1991's double album Use Your Illusion was arguably the band's last ever completed album. The Spaghetti Incident and GNR Lies are more like EPs than full records, and Chinese Democracy doesn't feature a number of members of the original lineup. By 1997, the GNR roster was whittled down to just frontman Axl Rose and keyboardist Dizzy Reed, though a 2016 reunion dubbed the Not In This Lifetime Tour brought back classic members Slash and Duff McKagan. Still, Use Your Illusion featured enough hit singles to keep fans satisfied throughout the early 90s, from the hard-rocking You Could Be Mine to soaring epic ballads like November Rain and Don't Cry. Athens, Georgia pioneers R.E.M. were already on their seventh alt-rock studio album by 1991. They'd even had a song Orange Crush, which had some limited success on terrestrial radio. Still, Out of Time elevated them beyond regional success to true international fame, largely on the strength of the breakout singles Losing My Religion and Shiny Happy People. True to its genre, the band offered a genuine alternative to most of the radio rock of the early 90s with a more poppy and tuneful approach to modern rock songs. R.E.M. also brought a sense of activism and public awareness to rock music that a lot of their 80s and early 90s counterparts had dismissed. Out of Time featured a petition in the back of the packaging encouraging fans to vote out politicians attempting to censor music. The campaign has been called one of the most politically significant in music history by 99% Invisible. Green Day's Kerplunk doesn't rank among the band's best known or best loved albums. In fact, its most noteworthy single, Welcome to Paradise, was re-recorded for their true breakthrough record, Dookie, which hit Tower Records shelves a few years later in 94. Still, the December 1991 release is notable for adding Trey Cool on drums and thus establishing the official Green Day lineup that is stuck together to this day. The album also got the group noticed by longtime label Reprise Records, which signed them following a bidding war. Pixies, a Boston, Massachusetts collective known for their loud, quiet, loud style and surf rock leanings, formed in 1986, getting a several-year head start on the burgeoning alternative rock scene. The group has been name-checked by everyone from Nirvana to The Strokes to Radiohead to Arcade Fire as a key early inspiration. Their 1988 song Cactus was even covered by David Bowie in the 90s. On the same day that Nirvana dropped their big breakthrough, Nevermind, Pixies released Trompe Le Monde, their final album before breaking up two years later. The constantly feuding group would later reform briefly in 2014. While it's usually not ranked among the top Pixies releases, the album still contains at least two confirmed classics from their discography, Planet of Sound and Head On. One of the many bands crediting the Pixies as an early inspiration was Chicago's Smashing Pumpkins, a notable counterpart to the droning, melancholy sounds coming out of Seattle in their first releases, the Pumpkins leaned more into the gothic and new wave style of groups like The Cure and My Bloody Valentine. In May of 1991, the band released their breakthrough album Gish, which essentially bridges the gap between their own unique vibe and the grunge sound that was currently taking over the world, adding a psychedelic, dreamy, and experimental touch to many of the songs. Notably, Producer Butch Vig worked behind the scenes on both Gish and Nevermind, personally contributing to the fusion of these many genres and influences. My Bloody Valentine had managed to impact bands like Smashing Pumpkins despite only releasing a single actual album in the entire preceding decade, 1988's Isn't Anything. The group returned with their second LP, Loveless, in November of 91, and essentially launched the shoegaze genre single-handedly, inspiring waves of later bands with fuzzy guitars and distorted vocals from Beach House to M83. Loveless never charted significantly in the U.S. and gradually built up a following over many years. Even the band holds this record in particularly high regard. They later claimed to have broken up because they felt that there was no topping their past success. 
with brilliantly trenchant and carefully observed lyrics like, What I got you gotta get and put it in you, there was no chance that the Red Hot Chili Peppers Blood Sugar Sex Magic wasn't going to make its mark on an entire generation of rock fans. After the 1988 death of original guitarist Hillel Slovak, who helped define the band's funk, reggae, and speed metal-inspired sound, this was the first Chili Peppers album to feature what would become the core lineup throughout their most successful years. Anthony Kiedis as frontman and Flea on the bass, accompanied by drummer Chad Smith and guitarist John Frusciante. It turns out, mellowing the guitar sounds and dropping some of the world music flavor made the group more palatable to mainstream rock fans. Nonetheless, it still took time for Blood Sugar Sex Magic to build a following. The album peaked at number three on the US Billboard 200, despite ultimately producing the hit singles Under the Bridge, Give It Away, Suck My Kiss, and Breaking the Girl. Frusciante, who'd been so key to shifting the group's sound, actually departed the group the following year during their 1992 tour, uncomfortable with suddenly becoming a world-famous rock star. He rejoined the lineup in 1998. There's no denying that rock music just got weirder in the 90s as post-punk, new wave, and other alt-rock bands started upending expectations, not just musically, but in terms of the perspective and the lyrics. One of the outright silliest acts to emerge from this era, Primus, also released their album in May 1991, Sailing the Seas of Cheese. But don't let the goofy sense of humor fool you. Les Claypool's bass playing is as serious as musicianship gets. Primus was a major rock act for many years and signed to a major label, but for later generations, they'll probably forever remain best known as the band that plays the South Park theme. So what do you think? What was your favorite 90s band? Let us know in the comments, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.